Okay? That is the Holy Trinity of consulting. And I said that I would deliver it to you in less than five minutes so I could move on with the agenda. So I have accomplished that. That part is the end of my speech. So I'm now going to introduce you to a man that I met, what was it, 15 years ago? 15 years ago at EMI. He was in to check up on what the Deloitte consulting team was doing because the client didn't trust us. <laughs> he had nothing to do. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Mark Vincent. All yours. And yes, it was the easiest job ever. So, let's start with a bit of uh, exercise, shall we? Raise your hands if you believe the ability to transform and adapt and change is critical to staying ahead. Raise your hands again if you would like to make that process easier, faster, and less risky, either in your organization or for your clients. Yeah? Well, that's the exercise done, right? So we, we can move on now. So how does it often end up feeling? Not necessarily for yourselves, of course, because you're all excellent, but for your mates when you're talking down the pub. What does transformation change often end up looking like? Or well, maybe you've got your milestones, you've got your plan, you've got your target operating model, clearly in sight. And then there you are, three months in, in one of those meetings, where nobody can agree on anything. Everybody's arguing amongst themselves about who's going to take responsibility. That's finance job, that's sales, that's marketing. Meanwhile, you can just see these milestones starting to slip. And my own personal favourite is you've just spent the last 15 minutes arguing about whether the status report is going to be red, amber or green. Who cares? And then meanwhile, there go the milestones. And you're having to go to your boss and explain what's happening. Or maybe there's an important decision that somebody was going to take. You know, the one that's going to cut out a pet project from one of the other executives and free up the resources you need to get it done. You know, that, that decision. The decision that means that the reorganization is going to be announced. And therefore, the transformation actually makes some sense. Except that hasn't happened, does it? What's actually happened is silence. What's actually happened now is you're having to pick up the pieces and try and work around this problem, yeah? Because the decision didn't get taken. Or maybe an announcement did get made, but at the wrong time. So now there's hairs racing all over the damn place and you're having to try and do some damage limitation to bring things back in order. Again, I'm sure this hasn't happened to any of you, of course, but it might have happened to your mates, yeah? So as a consequence of all of that, you're the ones sitting in meetings, trying to piece everything together, working the long hours, playing whack-a-mole with the issues that keep coming up and landing on your desk. Or maybe you've made it, right? You've got into the first phase. You've landed it. But nobody's really... Nobody's really using it. They're still using the old spreadsheets. They're still emailing stuff. The old behaviors are starting to creep back in. And so as a consequence of that, the data's not good enough. And the reporting can't be relied upon. But you've got the system in. So what could it look like? What would you like it to look like? What can it be like? Well, visualize not only hitting your deadlines, but you're three months in, and in fact, you've gone so well, you can get even bolder about the next phase of the transformation. You can sense the energy in the room. People are not only working together, they're, they're enjoying each other's company, they're collaborating well. Massive energy. It's fun, exciting. It's fun for you as well, leading the change. Or your clients leading the change. 
Everybody can feel it, a sense of excitement. And instead of playing whack-a-mole with issues, what's happening is the issues are coming up, but you're being told, we had this issue in Spain, but don't worry about it. We've dealt with it. It's all fine. We found a way to get through it. Envision people at the end of the transformation, those people in finance, in purchasing, in sales, in marketing, thinking about how they can really reimagine their roles using this new technology that's coming online. Thinking creatively, getting even more benefit because they can, they can see something new. They've had some great ideas. And they're coming to you with those great ideas. We could do even more. We could get even further if we do this. So how do you get from this kind of sorry place to something a little bit more optimistic? See, I believe the answer lies in the people. Of course, Mark, you're stating the obvious, what you're talking about. Yeah. But what I'm talking about here, we talk about winning the hearts and minds. But then what happens, as we were talking about in a conversation earlier, it be, it's a slide in a deck. We've got to win the hearts and minds. And then we move on and we do something else. Yeah? We leave that part wanting. What I'm talking about here is creating a situation where there's that sense of drive and commitment and want within the population. Not just the leaders, but everybody. So why does it matter? Why should we care? Have any of you seen the statistics on business transformation? What often ends up happening is we get, we get something done. Yeah, we get, it, we get something done. Not you guys, but your friends, right? Get something done. And it's sort of halfway in. You're in a sort of no man's land. You've got this technology landed, but you're not really getting any benefits. Or maybe you're getting some. If you're lucky, you might be only a little bit over budget. If you're lucky, you might only be six months late. Now, McKinsey have been talking about this for years. I mean, they talk about the so-called 70% failure rate, which, of course, everybody challenges. And rightly so, because it's not failure. What they're pointing at, though, is that most projects and programs don't achieve their objectives. And if you want to uh, take that even further, there's some really interesting work being done by the Oxford Business School. A guy called Bent Flyvio and his team have just, they've actually just written a book. And what they have is they've built up a database of 16,000 projects over about 20 years. And these include some of the biggest and uh, biggest global projects that exist. They, everything from construction to transport, big tunnels, bridges, all that kind of stuff, all the stuff we know about. And of course, also in there is IT. And what they found is that, well, let me, let me ask you a question. How many projects do you believe, as a percentage, are on time and on budget? Eight point five. I'm going to add in another dimension here, which is if you add benefits into that as well, on time, on budget, and deliver benefits. What does that number look like? Any ideas? It's low, low, isn't it? Yeah. Zero point five. Zero point five. So the question really. I mean, that could be a very depressing number. We all just, oh, that's it, I'm done. I'm going home now. <laughs> I'm going to pick a different job. I'm going to be a potter or something. All right, so you could, you could make that your thing, right? So, but we don't need to, do we? Because if you look at it the other way, 0.5% are getting it right. 0.5% are delivering on time, on budget, and huge benefits. They're doing what we're all gunning for. So what are they doing? What could we emulate? I'm just going to, four projects, 
I'm going to get you to reflect on. Empire State Building, Sydney Opera House, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, and Heathrow Terminal 5. One of those is the odd one out, and I'll come back to it later. So why does it matter now? Why are we even bothering to talk about this now? Because this has been true for 20, 30 years, you know, the performance around change and transformation, or projects as we used to call them. What's different? Well, of course, the pace. The pace of change today is incredibly different compared to just five years ago. We know, of course, all of the things that we're aware of, you know, the pandemic and all of the after effects of that, hybrid working, etc. Global energy crisis, conflict, all factors driving all kinds of different change. But underneath all of that is something really important, and that is the emergence of technologies. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the music industry, which was my background and where Michael and I met. Now, the music industry was essentially upended by one technology, the internet and digital online. One technology. Now we're facing into not only the continuation of that, but also autonomous vehicles, blockchain, 3D printing. And I've missed one out. What's the big one? AI, yeah? Machine learning. Look at the last few months and the chatter around ChatGPT, the nervousness that's being created. I'll tell you now, that genie is well and truly out of the bowl. And when you combine those technologies, trust me, we've not even begun to see the start of change pace. I'm going to ask you a question. When you're running a big global transformation, whether it's 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people, God forbid, what's really changing? So come back with me to February 2015. So I'm in New York, in Manhattan, and I'm working at the time for one of the major music labels. And just a bit of a backstory, at the time music was going through a massive transformation. Because even in 2015, CDs were still selling, but the sales were dropping off a cliff. And they were still busy trying to grapple with that and decide what to do with their infrastructure. So I'm standing outside this big, super high-rise building in Manhattan. So I'm, I'm sitting inside, sorry, inside this building. It's one of those funky buildings, as you can expect. I mean, back in the day, I mean, everybody's got breakout rooms and funky areas these days, but it was quite unusual back then. So you had artist paraphernalia everywhere, big, bright rooms, all this kind of stuff. Stereos everywhere. It was absolute joy. Except I'm in the basement. And the basement's a bit less joyful. Dark, dingy. It's one of those places they chuck project teams just to keep them out of the way. A bit like the smoking room in Cologne, right? <laughs> so it's got that, it's got that sort of slightly stale smell. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning. And you can kind of sense the bodies that have been working there till late in the night without going into too much detail. Imagine a boxing gym when you open it in the morning, right? That sort of. And there's pizza boxes everywhere and coffee cups. So I'm sitting in this room, listening to the traffic outside. The traffic noise seems to fade as I start to think about this next meeting, and actually the one I came from last night. I feel my throat starting to dry up, and a lump beginning to form in my throat. And in she walks, Miranda, the CFO, a New York Asian power dresser. You know the type, you know, think uh, Devil Wears Prada. She gradually walks in, walks up to the desk, bends down, puts her hands on the desk and looks at me. Mark, I'm not happy. My team, I'm not happy with what I'm hearing from my team. I told you it won't work. And I've got this sort of 
combination of frustration and a slight nervousness, frankly, because I'm, I'm a consultant as well. I'm an independent consultant, so I could also get fired. I don't want to get fired. I've had a good track record up to this point. I've won a lot of friends. In fact, the transformation that's led us here, we, it paid for itself already. We'd saved millions per year, admittedly some low-hanging fruit, but we'd got it. So I've got this frustration and also a bit of nervousness. Miranda, for goodness sake, we're only two weeks away from going live. If we go down the path you're suggesting, that customization you're suggesting, I'll tell you now, it's going to put us back months. And you will be exactly where you are now. You won't be any further forward. This operating model is proven. We've done it elsewhere. It works. You just need to get on board. Mark. I'm not going to try the accent, by the way. Just, just excuse me. I'm from Stroud in Gloucestershire. I don't do accents. Mark. It's my reputation on the line here. And I'm not comfortable. Make those changes. And then I'll consider whether I sign off. And remember, it's my call and I'm calling it. <sighs> Have any of you had that? Or any of your mates, right? You just can't seem to get through to the person in front of you. It seems obvious. She's got the same facts and figures I have. She knows this has worked elsewhere. But you just can't seem to get through. So, of course, we're left with the problem. You know, Yes, we have to make this huge amount of customization, which essentially is breaking us out of this well-proven common operating model where we knew what we were doing. And what happens when you take an untrodden path? Stuff comes up, doesn't it? Issues come up that you hadn't foreseen. Well, of course you hadn't, because you haven't done it before. And that's where we went. Month after month, meeting after meeting. One of my colleagues, Martin, is a rugby player. And he said, that felt like the worst rugby scrum ever. Yeah? He, was, he had no hair, but he was still tearing his hair out. So back and forth we went, back and forth. Eventually we got it over the line. We managed to score the try, if you want to use an analogy. Yeah, We got there. But of course, getting there, what did that really mean? What it meant was they had a new IT system. They kind of had new ways of working. But nobody was happy. There was precious little benefit coming. So about a year later, I bumped into an old buddy of mine, Kevin. So Kevin um, is, is one of those guys. He's been around change and transformation for many years. We've been friends since my days back at EMI. And he's, uh, he's a funny guy. He's always very, very energetic and good fun. And he's, he's got a white shirt on. It's a really hot day. We're sitting in Kensington. It's July, it's the following year, July 2016. So we're sitting in Kensington High Street having a coffee. Beautiful sunny, a bit like today. Beautiful sunny day. And... He's sitting there with his shirt, sort of all like this, and he's, he looks a little bit like Daniel Craig, you know, real, you feel like he's going to leap into action any minute. So we're talking about this thing, and he's going, oh, yeah, go on, tell me about it, Mark, tell me the story. So, I'm, so he said, um, what I don't understand, he said, is that what I don't understand is, is, you know, what you've always done is you've won people over, you know, that, that's your thing, right? So why was this so different? I said, well, I don't know, just couldn't get through. Just could not seem to get through. I couldn't, couldn't win them over, I couldn't get inside. It was like they were a closed unit and I just could not break into it. I just could not get through to them. Couldn't get them to get on board. And the weird thing is, they wanted it in the first place. They were the ones who said they wanted to get on board with this new model, they'd seen the numbers. And yet, when it came to it, they wouldn't. Mark, Mark, it's, but, but there was something you said, I remember early on, about trust. That they, they just didn't, you said that everybody was really defensive. 
You said, though, you know, you felt that in meetings. They were very defensive. And it kind of hit me in that moment that that was, that was what I'd missed. You see, in the U.S., at the time, in that organization, it was very much a hire and fire culture. It was a culture where you could literally be gone in two days if your face didn't fit. And also in the U.S., what you had was your health care provision was tied in to your employment. Quite often, your kid's education, private education, tied in to your employment. Or at least people were so highly geared with their salaries that losing their job in a couple of days was a major, major problem. So have a guess what was happening within that team. Everybody was showboating. Yeah? Everybody was bristling, yeah? like the big chickens in the meetings, all trying to outdo each other because they didn't trust each other. They didn't trust each other. They were always trying to outdo each other. They were always trying to compete. They were always trying to protect themselves and make themselves look good. Now, of course, what happens when you take an independent consultant from Europe, for goodness sake, and put them in the middle of all of that with a team that's also from Europe to deliver the project? Why would they trust us? They don't trust each other. And that was the problem. And most importantly, not only did they not trust us, but what if something went wrong? Because change involves an element of risk, right? You're going to do stuff differently. It's going to feel a little bit tricky for a while. They weren't prepared to accept that risk. So on the one hand, rationally, they knew they needed to make this change, but when it really came to it, they pulled back. And so what we ended up with was essentially what's the technical term, I think, is dog's dinner. That's what we ended up with, okay? But we did get there. And so my realization in talking to Kevin was it's always, always driven from where people are coming from individually, okay? And so I kind of resolved in that moment that surely this is the place to start, not to finish. It's not a slide in a deck that says win over the hearts and minds. This is where you start from. And so with my colleagues at Applied Change, we started to sort of develop this into an idea. You know, so how could we practically help clients to, to start there? What, what does it actually mean? And so we started to build this. We started to build tools to help them. And obviously, I, we used it um, in those clients. And in fact, I then continued to, to sort of evolve this idea. And of course, it wasn't easy, was it? Because I got the usual. I got the usual stuff, which is, can we just crack on with it now? We've done all this people fancy stuff, right? Fluffy wuffy. We don't need that. We've got a system to get done, right? Let's get deliver it. We're taking too much time in discussion. We need to move it on. I got that. But I thought, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it. I'm going to stick with it. And what I noticed was, as I got people more comfortable, understood where they were coming from, figured out ways to present this in a way that made them the hero of this change narrative, then my job started to get a bit easier. They were solving the issues. They were telling me they found better ways to achieve this objective, to get there faster, to get there better. So my job got gradually easier. And I really saw this come to a head with a project for a UK company and in the, at the time, it was one of the biggest UK companies uh, in, in terms of a market. That was the biggest market. It was the highest risk market. And we had to do a transformation for them, which we'd done elsewhere. And typically, it had taken us 9 to 12 months. That was the quickest we'd done it. And in the UK, we had to do not only what we'd done, which was order to cash, we had to also add in new customer service function and 
a new credit control function. And for various reasons, I won't go into the detail, but we had to get this done much more quickly. So we were staring, myself and the project team, at this impossible plan. We needed to get it done in five months. We'd never done it in less than nine, even for a small country. Five months. And we've got to do these other two things as well. We all looked at each other. We went, I think I'll go and do a different job. We, we've literally no idea. We got it done. We hit it. We got it done in five months. Minimal issues. And you'd think the story would stop there, wouldn't you? That, that's great. Move on. But what was really interesting about that and what, what I enjoyed the most about it was the energy in the room. People came up to me months, years afterwards and said, oh, how much fun was that? They thoroughly enjoyed the process. We talk a lot about people resist change. People don't like change. Now, there was a mixture of different personality types in that change program, I can tell you. They all enjoyed the process. They all felt they were part of something, part of something bigger. And so going back to my original question, where does change really come from? 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people. Where does the change really come from? Yeah, anybody want to offer some ideas? It's in here. Everybody makes their own change. They get on board or they don't. So I asked you also about the four projects. So just as a reminder, Empire State Building, Sydney Opera House, Guggenheim Bilbao, Heathrow Terminal 5, which is the odd one out. We've had all, I think we've had all of them so far. <laughs> so it's definitely one of them. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely one of them. It's, it's the Sydney Opera House. And it's the Sydney Opera House because all of the other three were on time, on budget, and delivered huge benefits. The Sydney Opera House, in contrast, was 14 times over budget. The poor guy... Jörn Utz, who was the architect of it, had to leave Australia in shame with his family, and he never built another building again in his life. It's also, think about the name, it's also completely unsuited to opera. Now, when you look at those three projects that were successful, and you look at the Sydney Opera House situation, so just a bit of a backstory on Sydney Opera House. Jim Carhill, who was the premier of New South Wales at the time, had decided that he, he was actually he had cancer. He was dying, sadly. Um, and, but he wanted something to be remembered by. He wanted a statement, because he knew that all the policies and things that he'd done, some good stuff, that would get forgotten. He wanted something big. And so he literally went for it with the Sydney Opera House. But he went for it in a way where he just wanted to get momentum. He wanted to get spades in the ground to a point where it couldn't be undone. And essentially what happened is from that place, from that ego place, the whole thing unraveled. And the reason he did it is because he knew he wouldn't got support. Simple as that. There were too many other issues going on and he wouldn't have got support from his party. So he went down that route. But looking at the other three, the opposite was also true. Everybody believed in the endpoint. Heathrow Terminal 5 was an interesting one because, of course, there was a little bit of bad press when it first launched. But when you look at the backstory, what you actually had was a group of contractors all coming together to a common purpose. And the leaders of T5, what they did was made that the thing. You know, we realize you all work for different companies, but when you're on site here, we're T5 team. 
And they really, really took that to the nth degree. And they set a deadline which had never been achieved. And, and they hit it. In fact, they, I can't remember the actual date. It was, I think it was 2007. And they literally said, 4 o'clock in the morning, the coffee will be on. Sure enough, it was. And of course, it's usually the benefits are exactly what, what they expected. And it was on time, on budget. And the other interesting thing, and this is true of all of those big projects, the same with Guggenheim, is you have that same energy from the people who were involved. They loved being part of it. They all spoke for years afterwards about how much fun it was, what they learned from it, the sense of camaraderie and the team building that went as a result. That's me done in terms of the main part of it. I'm more than happy to, evolve, to continue with the conversation around you know, how, the how part. We can do that later or now. How are we doing for time, Michael? Quarter to 11, we're good. Uh, is you don't know what state of mind the people are in that you're going in to transform. And there's one of the other things I, I normally say when I do one of these speeches is you should never run a transformation program unless you've transformed yourself. Unless you've actually taught yourself a, something as simple as I'm dropping half a stone or I'm going to learn a new skill or I'm going to learn how to play bridge or something, get outside your comfort zone. You, you, unless you go through that kind of process as an adult, why on earth would someone who rocks into work from nine to five and according to an organization structure works for you just change because you've got a project plan with a set of milestones on it? It's not what it's about at all. It is literally what's in there and what's in here. And how you tap into that is something to be quite frank, after 25 years, I'm still trying to work out. And I would say to an extent, because actually the EMI one was a good example, uh, we dealt with two completely dysfunctional regional finance directors who would not speak to each other. So the smoking room in Cologne that he was referring to was a room for your typical Deloitte team and about 10 or 12 others. And the chap who was regional CFO, who was nominally running the transformation program, spoke into the squawk box at one of the other FDs responsible for three of the countries, and the two lads would not directly talk to each other. They effectively used the people in the room in order to conduct a peer-to-peer -peer conversation. Now, had we, when we were taking on that project, said, could somebody please personality profile the people we have to deal with? <laughs> yes, it would have helped us, but absolutely nobody would have done it for us. So when you get dropped in from an interim perspective, you've no idea what personalities you're dealing with. And it differs according to two main things, in my opinion. The background and status of the company itself. So if we were to go in to do change management in um, Google, it's an entirely different ball game to me walking into a four to 500 million turnover company in the UK that's on the verge of going into a bad place. They're not the same beast at all when it comes to changing them. So there's a whole change spectrum as to how things are done. I can obviously tell you to do something, and you may have to do it because you work for me. I can inspire you to do something, which is extremely difficult to do. So as I explained to you earlier when we were the motivational speakers of the previous speech, how long did that stick with you? How long, when you went away from the talk, were you actually still having that work for you? Um, so you never know what state the people who are to be transformed are in, in their own personality background and in their own lives. And you also are never sure what type of client you're going to be dealing with in terms of what its background is. They bring about pressures across the company and they bring about pressures across the people. And we have to alter the style that we deploy in order to deal with that. We either have to go in and be occasionally directional if it's uh, time short and the company is obviously in trouble, or we're dealing with the likes of Google and it's like, well, we'll have plenty of change forums. We can sit around and we'll discuss what makes you happy or what makes you tick and what gives you a problem. And then we'll deal with that because we have time because they have money. So that's a different ball game, different type of client, different type of problem. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, I would safely say, although we delivered that project in Germany, those two lads still didn't speak to one another. I eventually put them in the same room by putting them in a bar. But, uh, like, I mean, that's what you're, that's what you're reduced to. You're, you're trying to find common ground between people in order to get them to engage. Um, but the challenge is, if, if one grown adult doesn't want to deal with another grown adult, 
they don't have to. You know, just take a look around the world, how many people are divorced. They're divorced because they couldn't put up with each other any longer. Yeah. Does it think it's any different in work? Go into the office tomorrow morning and take a good look around the teams that you do, and they're all going through something different. They may all be great. Some of them might be well up for change because they benefit from it, obviously, and obviously there are losers in change when it's done on quite a grand scale. Um, but you've no clue what's going on in someone else's head. None whatsoever. And you have to be very, very careful with how you play that game. Because it is a game. It's a mindset game. Because I want you to do something. I want you to do something that you didn't think of doing when you rocked out of bed at 7 o'clock this morning. So I've either got to convince you, tell you, inspire you, or as Jose Mourinho used to say, leave a whole load of trip notes so that you fell over and did it yourself. And then I just said, oh yeah, that was down to me. <laughs> Sent in the bill. So I don't know. It's a, a lot of you have plenty of experience in different companies, in different environments. And it's not necessarily the leading of a change program that has changed. How do you actually, as myself and Max spent hours talking about last night, how do you convince somebody to buy something? So, because well, what is part of a finance transformation program? You're selecting who's going to run the program. Inevitably, you're selecting a consultancy of some form or shape or size, and you've got to pick one. Then you're selecting a piece of software, which Mark will come on to in the afternoon. You're dealing with, as, as Mark mentioned, the sheer pace of change. I can't even keep up with what ChatGTP actually stands for. Um, and all of the opportunities that that brings. And you're struggling with all this. It's like, yeah, God. Like, it, this all still fundamentally comes back to how the two human beings interact with one another. AI will not replace the tactics you deploy in order to get another human being to do something different. It might replace what the human being is doing. It's not going to do it any other way. So one of the, one of the reasons I was pointing down this way was uh, Rob, who I met over 20 years ago when I was running one of my last projects for Argos, is he's a born salesman. So what, what are the different attributes? Because essentially, you want somebody to buy on the bottom line and go, I'm buying this system. How, what's, what's, what's different? You know, how do you, have you any tips? Have you any thoughts on it? Do you want to? I wasn't expecting that question, Mark. Well, I, I thought I'd surprise you. Pass, pass that one back there. For me. I think, look, if you, I have a career selling technology, so you have to be fixing a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and I think you have to truly understand what needs to be fixed to have a point of view that resonates with the buyer. Um, while I've got the mic, and I wasn't expecting that question, I'm going to completely answer another question, which is, so why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I very recently joined... A, an extremely technical software business. They're a deep tech AI. You know, it's a bit of a worn out phrase these days, but the relevance to transformation is we help any leader, anybody that's managing a change program, figure out how work gets done now. So I won't bore you now, because you told me to keep it to 60 seconds, how we do that. But if any of you have ever been in meetings where you've got a bunch of folks, subject matter experts, business analysts, arguing about how work gets done, because I have. I once had my car locked in a car park because it was snowing when the conversation began. And when the conversation finished, there was four foot of snow. And I, that was just before Christmas. So I went through a whole Christmas break without a car because of an argument about how work gets done. So, look, if that's a problem or if that's a challenge, then maybe we've got some technology that will help answer that. Yeah? So, what that actually completely demonstrates is, so, what did I ask as a question <laughs> and what answer did he give me? Because he's, he, he is a skilled salesman. That's the reason he sold us the stuff so well 20 years ago. Um, and that was a process that went on at least six months. Easily, yeah. 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 But but what actually made the sale in the end was the relationship. Because if we were being honest about it, there was probably ten companies for some ridiculous reason included in the selection process. But it was the relationship you built that put you into the final part from which you pushed it over the end. So it's those interpersonal personality skills which make the difference. And actually what he was amply demonstrating is exactly how he sells, because what I was asking him wasn't going to help him sell anything. So, you know, and some people do possess those skills. The rest of us don't. We, we were discussing this again last night as well. 
although we lead change programs, I'm not a psychologist. You know, I've, like, you know I, can, I can go through what I've learned over the years, and I've probably been, as several of you probably have done, the Myers-Briggs tests in order to work out what personality you are. Do any of you who've run programs and have either done the test yourself or suggested that someone else does them actually use the results? Have you? I, I think the reality is that you kind of, when you're leading a change like that, you have to try and grasp at least the basics of psychology because that is actually what you're dealing with. Yeah. That is ultimately the topic. You know, it's not the boxes and wires and the software that gets delivered. It's the people that actually do it, right? I think there's a, there's a recent Ian Y report that talks exactly about this, and the title of the report is um, "People Are the Problem and the Solution." Yeah, regardless of what it is you're trying to change, and that's going to be true even as Chat GPT emerges, because I firmly believe that it's the human component. And especially if we get better at communicating, which we're getting worse at at the moment, that's what's going to save the day when it comes to our ongoing relationship, let's say, with, a, with AI. Yeah? When humans truly collaborate, truly work together, history has proven we are unstoppable. And so what we're actually talking about, which is where psychology comes in, change and transformation, that's what we're aiming to unleash, is that unstoppable force. And that is where transformation really comes from, in my view. I talking to crowds, I always tell them it comes down to the people. I might have several, as indeed several of them are in the room, technology partners, because the way I look at things, like I said earlier, what's the problem? What are we going to do about it? But within what we're going to do about it, there might be five different options. Three of those might be a piece of tech. They might not be across the piece. They might be in a point position. And two of them are most definitely how do I actually change the team. And I haven't transformed a single function without actually altering the people that are in it. And that's either plucking superstars out of teams who are being pressed down by middle managers who, who want to keep them down because they don't, you know, they don't have the skill set themselves to keep advancing. Um, and so I always review the people. I always review them to see, is this somebody who I would have hired? That's the first question I asked. The second question is, would I promote them? And then the third question is, is there somebody who has prevented the upward trajectory of this career and that this person needs to be freed? And one of the most interesting things I did, because uh, I, I now I've reached the grand old age of 52, Every single thing we do is psychology. Now, I don't use Microsoft Project. When I go into a client and they say to me, would you like a log on to the system? I go, no, what for? Is it how you're paying me? I don't need to log on to the system. I'm not here to change the system. We will change the system between us. I'm here to change how you think, what you do, the fact that you love being here, the fact that you want to be here, and the fact that you're better than you were before you met me. That's my job, and it's all up here. So I get under the skin of teams, to work out how they tick psychologically, and I start to motivate them by setting them little tests. And one of the things I did, which is completely um, along the lines of what Mark's talking about, is I took a team of about 150 people who had way too many layers. So it was like my designated first team, and then we had a, a leader, a team leader, a supervisor, all this kind of nonsense. So I had about three middle layers that I didn't require. So I took one look at it and I went, yeah, this, we need to squash this, okay? And then I looked at the layer underneath that they were keeping down, and I thought, well, the talent is down here. I'm gonna free the talent. So I created something along the lines of Animal Farm, and I said, I'm gonna create a management academy. And I says, for every Friday, sorry, Friday once a month, Every one of you that does not have a staff responsibility for someone else can go sit in a room. You can have two hours, you can do what you like. I do not care what you do. So naturally enough, they generally tend to be the younger ones and the least experienced. They go in and they think for two hours they can do what they like. And basically, psychology takes over. There are natural leaders within the group. So all of a sudden, the natural leaders start to stand up and go, well, do not think the boss sent us in here so we can actually do something productive? And then they come out with ideas. And to my absolute total astonishment after three months of doing this, they had formed their own layers of hierarchy within their group. 
their managers were not allowed into it. And then they said to me, they wanted to make a presentation. And I said, yeah, cool, no problem. Let's see what you can do. There's the thing. Knock yourself out with the slides. <laughs> don't laugh, Nigel. <laughs> and they did. And they saved me. I don't know what they saved me. They saved me a fair chunk of change in temporary recruitment costs anyway. But they, they, they thought through what they were responsible for. They came up with an idea, they took responsibility, they came to me, of course, wide-eyed, going, we've come up with this idea, boss, what do you think? I said, yeah, you reward that. Because you switched on a light bulb in every one of them, which went, I want to do something positive. Yeah, but then you have to reward them for it. You have to show them that you've removed the blockers in that structure, and then they keep giving. And when you come in to work in the morning, particularly because I, my generally type of client is something that requires to be turned around. And you go in, and the first thing that you will experience is resistance, outright resistance, terrorists, that's resistance that you don't know is there, okay? And then those of them that are like, I don't care whether he's here or not, I'm not going to do it. And then there's the one or two of them that are over here going, oh, we have a new boss, we might have a chance. And we work on the one or two, and we gradually start to go, this is the example, you ought to follow the example, because I have no interest in this. And you attempt to be a terrorist in this, and you'll soon be removed. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what you're looking for. You're looking to free talent, and that when you walk into work in the morning, they're all thinking, what's he going to set us to do next? When's he going to get us to swap jobs? When I worked for Argos, I had uh, one of the first teams I was given, and they were all at that age where they were young, and they were well-educated. They all rocked out of university, all much smarter than me. And uh, I came in one Monday morning, third week of the month, and I said, these are all swapping ledgers. And they looked at me like they'd done something wrong. <laughs> They're like, why? <laughs> and I said, no, you are all swapping ledgers. You have two weeks to get ready for month end. And that's what they did. And they worked it out between them. And they didn't die. Nothing, nothing you know, catastrophic happened. And then they were like, a month later, they were like, well, you we can do this. What's the next challenge you're giving us? You have to actually, I know it's a, um, probably a trite statement given the location that we're in. But you have to actually view your teams like a sporting team. If they're not motivated and switched on, then they're either one of two things, they're completely neutral and they're not contributing, or they're actually actively working against you. You have to watch all that when you're leading change programs. And uh, Nigel, I'm sure, can add a lot more as he leads it across quite substantial territories and, and uh, numbers. Do you want to add anything else? Oh, no, <laughs> he's, he's keeping his powder dry. Because if you get one or two superstars, what often then happens um, is that they'll call the shots and everyone else just backs away. What you actually want is balance in the room, right? You want those differences. You want those crazy, mad ideas that actually suddenly make sense, yeah? That's the sort of stuff you're looking for. And it happens when you get a diverse, we overuse the word diverse, but you know what I mean, diverse group of people with different backgrounds, different experiences, really coming together and that's when the magic truly happens but be really careful of the superstars in fact i think it's google that, that actively weeds them out yeah. from or at least when i last read about them they did so yeah really big really important spot i mean that's the point is that people get defensive and they hold on to what could be great ideas because they're afraid to share them yeah go on Yeah, just, just saying from our experience working with a lot of transformation, um, and again coming back to the, you know, the motivation, what we find is if you can isolate the problem that is being solved and isolate the person who's up at night worrying about that problem, and if they are coincidentally senior people, then you're in with a chance. If you're in a situation, we, I, we do, we do you know, more than finance transformation, we do whole pieces, but typically with an ERP, somebody has sold an ERP solution into the CIO, and then the CIO becomes the accountable executive for fixing all of the operational problems and challenges of the organization, which is owned by his colleagues on the C-suite. So immediately you've got two camps, and then people have got a choice. I either join the change camp, or I'll stick with my mates who are telling us that it won't work. And actually, that's hard, really, really hard. And you need a strategy for working out how you get to those stakeholders. And actually, part of that was down to the definition of the problem you're trying to solve. Because every problem, when you think about it, revolves into a business problem at some point. Yeah, we talk about, yeah, we talk about business objectives all the time. If I can't see line of sight 
from what we're being asked to do to a problem that's on the board's agenda or a senior person's agenda, then why are you spending that money? Why? Yeah, and they're, they're usually disruptive, and within six months, the IT director or the CIO is blamed for the chaos. That's, it's not his fault. <laughs> it's the, the only thing he's done is accept the challenge. Yeah. Excuse me while I juggle microphones. This one's working, so you can go ahead with this one. Thank you. Um, completely agree with everything you've said, Mark. Um, the one thing we haven't talked about, and exists very much so in finance, is regulation. So when I was at NetWest, I was responsible for the change portfolio. It was about £150 million a year, of which half was used to spend on mandatory regulatory obligations. Okay. Now, that kind of change is often very... I guess, uh, well, first of all, you're time bound, so you've got to do it by a certain time. It's not necessarily value adding. And, and some of that, Sorry. then again, one of the techniques we would use was the, okay, we've got to do this. We know we've got to spend the money. We've got to, we've got to achieve this compliance by you know, 1st of Jan in year X. But what can we do at the same time that will make the world better and bring some value at the same time? So we're going to achieve regulatory compliance, but we're going to create value. And Often at the top uh, of the house, we're talking about, okay, we must comply because we're going to get fined. But when you bring the wider business in and you know, engage with them on the, on the achievement, you can actually get them to open their minds up and create value at the same time. So what we were able to do is not only comply with regulation, but improve life for finance off the back of that. And that was effectively for free because that's not what we were set out to spend the money on. It was just to comply with the a regulation, and, and that's never going to go away. So it's about getting the biggest bang for our buck. And yet many organizations focus on the avoiding fines. Yes, exactly. I don't think you guys are familiar with a story. Um, it's a story uh, Alcoa, who are a big processing company in the US. And they had a new... Um, see, they're basically, they were in trouble. They were losing money, um, hand over fist, and they were in big trouble. So as a new CEO joined the company, and... They were expecting great things from the CEO. He'd done great things elsewhere. And he came in and gave a speech. And they were all, all you can imagine, all the analysts are sitting there. God, this is going to be fantastic. You know, going to get really excited, get ready to buy shares and all this stuff. And he said, right, what we're going to talk about today is safety. From now on, zero accidents is our objective. And you can imagine now these analysts are sitting there and go, can we start talking about profits, please? Because that's what we're here to talk about, right? Why is he talking about safety? But what he did, he led that organization on a zero-tolerance mission around safety. And what that meant was he was making sure, he was um, encouraging everybody in the organization to identify any near misses, anything. And he said, the only time anybody will ever get in trouble is where they cover stuff up. If you see something, you tell us. Bar none. And he went through the whole organization with that approach. And what happened over time, of course, is in order to get to zero accidents, any near misses basically had to be reported and thoroughly analyzed to avoid them happening again. So as a consequence of that, people started to look at the processes that were causing the problems. They were getting right into the root causes. So they start to streamline and sort out these dysfunctional processes. In fact, I think there was one guy that did show up that, that they'd covered something up in Brazil, and he got fired. So this guy really went for it. But bit by bit, they forensically went through everything. Well, of course, what do you think happened to their profits? It went through the roof. So going back to the story about compliance, there's always a reason for that, right? And it's beyond avoiding the fines. It's actually saying, well, actually, we can be so much better. There is a bigger thing we're reaching for here. And I think that's what inspires people, to your point, is what's the big thing that we're reaching for? You know, because people, you know, people get, get paid, of course, and all that. But they turn up for work for something else. 
They turn up for work to be inspired by something. And so for me, that's, that's the hook you're looking for. Yeah? That's what you're trying to dig towards in any transformation. It's not about the IT system. Everybody's got one of them. Everybody's got a transformation going on, a digital transformation. It's what, as an organization, what are you reaching for? And how will this enable you to get there? need to do the, the basics, the fundamentals. But what I found over the years is that, you know, particularly when it comes to budgets, many of these transformation budget, budgets, program budgets, they can be, um, let's say, owned to a large part um, by IT, uh, as opposed to the business. And IT, and you know, apologies to any real dedicated IT people 